Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, it's actually a, an extreme pleasure for me to introduce Professor Han. I met him at WITS while I was senior lecturer at UJ. I went to ask him about Morse power, knowing very little about it, and he was kind enough to explain, so that I ended up using it. And he just told me he still has my data on his computer. So. <laughs> Professor Giovanni Hearn was born in Port Elizabeth and matriculated in 1977 from St. Thomas High School in Port Elizabeth with the highest mark in the Eastern Cape region, at that time known as the Cape Senior Certificate, Colored Affairs. He was inspired into a career in physics by his high school teacher and by curiosity invoked by spending countless hours in the municipal library of his community in PE. In the late 1970s, he was not permitted to pursue further physics studies at the University of Port Elizabeth, now in MMU, because of government policy at the time. He sought ministerial permission to attend a leading institution, University of the Witwatersrand, which was duly granted. He completed all his degrees in physics um, at WITS in the 1980s and early 1990s. As a postgraduate, he was mentored by Professor Berend Kolk, an expert in Mossbauer spectroscopy, who hailed from the University of Groningen, of uh, one of the oldest universities in the Netherlands, and from Boston University in the USA. Kolk tragically passed away halfway through Giovanni's PhD, and the main responsibilities for keeping the Mossbauer Research Lab running rested on his shoulders. He completed his PhD in tin Mossbauer spectroscopy of superconducting systems under caretaker supervisor Professor Michael Hoch, an NMR specialist, and Professor Hermann Pollack, a Mossbauer specialist. Giovanni moved on to postdoctoral research in 1992 at Tel Aviv University in Israel. There he pioneered the use of iron Mossbauer <coughs> spectroscopy in diamond anvil cells for the study of magnetic electronic properties at high pressure with group leader Moshe Pasternak and Dean Taylor of Los Alamos National Laboratory in the USA. He returned to an academic position at WITS in 1996 and spearheaded DAC high pressure research activities involving various probing techniques. This included primarily iron Mossbauer spectroscopy, laser Raman, and Brillouin spectroscopy with Prof. Daryl Commons and students, and X-ray diffraction for structural pressure studies. Activities also included various synchrotron-based high-pressure research studies with overseas collaborators. In the early part of his research career, he received the President's Award for Emerging Researchers from the FRD, NRF equivalent at the time, and the University Vice Chancellor's Research Award. He assumed leadership of the Mossbauer Research Lab at WITS in 2001. Up to 2009, he was involved in magnetic electronic pressure studies of various tropical iron-based systems, investigating the pressure responses of nanomaterials and as part of his involvement in the Center of Excellence in Strong Materials, um, a search for new pressure-stabilized ultra-hard materials. This research involved international collaborations with German and French groups in Conn and Paris. The Mossbauer Lab at WITS also serviced various industrial and applied science project, projects involving biochemistry, mineral processing, and catalysis. He was awarded the University Council Fellowship and an NSTF Science and Technology Award for his research efforts during the second half of his research career at WITS. Um, in 2009, Giovanni decided on a change of environment and moved his research operations to the Department of Physics at UJ. The School of Physics at WITS generously permitted him to relocate much of the specialized high pressure research equipment. A Mossbauer lab was re-established at UJ APK using equipment previously relocated from Vista University. Variable temperature Mossbauer spectroscopy, including unique capabilities for DAC Mossbauer studies at high pressure, remain operational to date. In addition, he has new capabilities for electrical transport pressure studies in DACs, a laser heating facility for attaining concurrent high pressure conditions in a DAC has also been re-established at UJ Phys uh, Physics as part of his continued involvement in the Center of Excellence in Strong Materials. Squid magnetization uh, pressure capabilities with prostratum has also de been developed. Non-conventional synchrotron X-ray probes at international facilities in Europe also currently <coughs> form part of his investigative arsenal for high pressure studies. The high pressure related studies at UJ involved international research collaborations with col uh, col colleagues in Conn, Germany, Paris, France, and Edinburgh, UK. 
Two PhD students and a lecturer colleague from the DFC campus are involved, and two postdocs have previously been involved um, in the in-house UJ activities. A further two MSc students are involved in a high-pressure research project in chemistry catal uh, catalysis investigations. He has regular requests to perform iron MOS power spectroscopy service or analytical work in fields involving chemistry, catalysis, and mineral processing applications. To date, Professor Han has 54 peer-reviewed um, journal publications and 22 refereed conference proceedings spanning the domains of research and projects mentioned above. He has a current ISI Web of Science H index of 20 and has a B3 rating from the NRF. His current research lab at UJ, in conjunction with collaborators involving other colleagues in the physics department, has arguably the foremost capabilities in the southern hemisphere for research on materials at variable extreme pressure conditions. So ladies and gentlemen, I introduce Professor Giovanni Hahn. Well, uh, to the functionaries, uh, thank you for those kind words and uh, for acknowledging some of my achievements. And um, 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 to uh, the audience, I know it's a late, late hour and it's the middle of the week and it's quite a stretch for you to be here. So I really appreciate uh, that you've come. Uh, uh, the topic is uh, the properties of materials under extreme pressure and temperature conditions. We are normally familiar with variable temperature and variable composition of materials um, uh, in order to enhance their properties or in to, in to investigate them. And varying the pressure is something uh, rather unusual. And uh, that will be the emphasis of my talk. So the plan of the talk uh, is as follows. It's uh, three sections. Um, why are these extreme conditions important? What effect do they have on materials? How do we attain these extreme PT conditions? <coughs> what are our local, local capabilities established over the last several years? And then I'll move on to some examples of uh, investigations of materials under extreme PT. I'll spend about 10 to 15 minutes uh, on each section. Uh, focus your attention in the corner here. When it comes to the application of materials, we're often interested in performance and lifetime, and it's normally concentrated in this uh, sector over here, and we wish to enhance performance and we wish to enhance lifetime of materials. And uh, in fact, we can do that by transforming materials. We normally do that by changing composition, the ingredients in the material. And what I'll demonstrate that you can also do so by the variation of pressure. And here's an example, Nick. and in doing that, um, you can bring about quite enhanced performance and lifetime of uh, a wider suite of materials, which we refer to as transformational materials. Here's an example here of uh, zirconium metal, which, for example, is very important in the nuclear industry. And I have temperature on this axis and pressure on this axis. And if I, I at ambient pressure, it's in the so-called alpha phase. It's a particular structure. And if I increase the temperature, it remains in the alpha phase and it eventually will convert to something called the beta phase, which is a different structure. But in fact, if you vary the pressure as well, never mind the units for now, okay. you can go into a third structural form, polymorph phase, called the omega phase, which has highly desirable properties. Just to illustrate the importance of having another thermodynamic variable besides composition, besides temperature. If you look at this uh, molecular compound, uh, we have a molecular network here referred to as a porphyrin with iron in the center. 
And if you squeeze this, this appendage here tends to bend. It alters the electronic structure of the iron, and it changes from being mag strongly magnetic to weakly magnetic. There's huge interest in this as a single molecule magnetic switch, which I've worked on, or as a, a molecular magnetic sensor. And uh, in fact, what we live on and what we stand on every day is a situation of extreme pressure temperature conditions. As we delve deep into the Earth, those are, ex those are variable pressure temperature conditions. And in fact, at the core, we have 3.8 million atmospheres of pressure and temperatures of 5,000 Kelvin. Okay? Let me point out to you that on your head at the moment is one atmosphere of pressure. The core has 3.8 million atmospheres of pressure. Okay? So these extreme conditions and environments <coughs> cut across all these disciplines. Since I'm, the emphasis is on pressure, for those who are unfamiliar, let me point out that pressure is nothing else but the force distributed over area. And if we look at these cases over here, on this elephant's head, that's fine, on this elephant's head, is one atmosphere of pressure from the surroundings, as is the case on your head, okay? And due to the weight of this element over the area of its foot, it uh, exerts four atmospheres of pressure on the ground. This lady, who weighs 60 kilograms, <laughs> exerts <laughs> as much as 50 atmospheres on a heel, okay? And if you drive a nail into an object and you use typically 60 kilograms of force over that small area, you generate in that process thousands of atmospheres, about 7,000 atmospheres. That's just, just to give you a feeling, okay? And so I want you to focus on um, the scale up here, okay? There is one atmosphere, what you are experiencing on your head. There is uh, four atmospheres, which, which is what you have uh, at the cork in a champagne bottle. Uh, that's what I, the, the kind of pressure I feel right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's 10,000 atmospheres, one GPA. Okay. Just give it another label. GPA, 10,000 atmospheres, one GPA. That's a million atmospheres, and that's four million atmospheres, typical of the center, the core of the Earth. And I just put this up to emphasize, and I'll demonstrate that in the laboratory, the home lab environment, we can access this range over here. Okay? And why is it important? Because when we apply pressure to a material, squeeze a material, we bring the atoms closer together, we change the volume, and in this range of 1 GPA to 100 GPA, 10,000 atmospheres to a million atmospheres, we can change the volume as much by as much as 10 to 25 percent. Okay? You can also change the volume of a material by cooling it or heating it, in which case it expands. <laughs> but in that case, for comparison, if you were to heat the material to several hundred degrees, that would be the volume change, limited to something like 1 to 2 percent. 1 to 2 percent. So pressure can really wreak havoc within a solid. Here's an example of uh, the important effect of pressure. Uh, this alloy, iron silicon, uh, with a plot here of resistance versus temperature, and you notice that uh, the resistance increases as the temperature degrees, decreases. It's typical non-conducting, insulating behavior. And as the pressure is increased, there's a radical change to the character of those curves. And in fact, here at 20 GPA, that's 200,000 atmospheres, okay? This, the resistance decreases <coughs> as a function of temperature, okay? Typical metallic behavior. We've transformed this from an insulator into a metal, okay? Let's thank Martin for uh, that nice example. 
and uh, he's transferred uh, this knowledge and the knowledge of this methodology to us. To my physics colleagues, what we've in fact done, as you recognize, is we've modified the electronic structure and closed the gap over here by increasing pressure and reducing the interatomic spacing. <coughs> on this slide, I've plotted temperature on this axis in funny units, time on this axis, and pressure on this axis. Room temperature is down here somewhere. If I change the temperature of the material and wait, wait a certain amount of time and investigate it, we, fairly, we understand fairly well what is going on. If I stay at room temperature, that's this plane, if I stay at room temperature and change the pressure, that's on this plane, it's somewhat well understood. If I vary the temperature to high temperatures and the pressure, that is very poorly understood and largely unexplored. And, and the same applies to decreasing the pressure, the plane at the bottom. Just to emphasize the importance of concurrent extreme PT. Now, if you want to generate uh, these extreme pressure temperature environments, environments, this is not the way to do it. <laughs> In fact, this is the way you go about doing it. You use a diamond anvil cell. Two diamonds, polish off the tips to get what we call uh, diamond anvils, and then get for yourself a metal foil drill a hole into it, insert your sample into the hole, and squeeze that between the diamonds to have a configuration like this. The important thing is that the diamond is hard, so you can uh, apply uh, reasonable, substantial forces, and most importantly, you can view through the diamonds into the cavity. And you can generate very high pressures of hundreds of thousands of atmospheres because you can apply substantial forces over very small areas. And here's a very nice example of how this is a window. Uh, this important layered semiconductor near ambient condition starts off yellow in color. This is a view into the cavity through one of these diamonds. Then it changes to a color of red at 50,000 atmospheres. And at 100,000 atmospheres, it's gone opaque. And for the benefit of my uh, physics colleagues, we know what we are doing here. We've been we are tuning the electronic band gap of, of this material. The important thing is you can also bring different forms of interrogating electromagnetic radiation into this cavity to probe the material, besides viewing it visibly, as indicated over here. Here's some uh, further detail of how this device works. We apply a force like this to generate the pressure on the compound. These are the typical dimensions. We call this the culet. It's about half a millimeter um, uh, in, in diameter. Uh, if we apply a force of 700 kilograms, which you can do quite readily and quite conveniently, we can generate up to 350,000 atmospheres fairly routinely. If we reduce this area and therefore reduce the size of the cavity, with modest forces of 100 kilograms, you can get up to a million atmospheres. And there's a view into a cavity of a sample at uh, 200,000 atmospheres. Um, here's a very nice example, of, again, of this device being a window into extreme environments of both uh, pressure and temperature. Um, the interiors of these planets comprise mainly H2O. And uh, this has been squeezed, when it's squeezed to over a million atmospheres, okay? Uh, we have ice, and you see a picture in the cavity here of an ice crystal. And now we heat it to simulate the conditions of the interior. And this was done by uh, Jonathan Crowhurst, who was a former student of uh, my respondent and who learned the technique uh, in my lab if I can get it working. And there's the laser spot on the ice crystal. Okay. And you zap it with a laser in order to uh, achieve heating. <coughs> I'm sorry. And this is the effect. 
over 2,000 degrees, over a million atmospheres. And what's important to notice, the profile of the crystal remains intact. It remains as solid ice without melting. Okay, so it really shows how this can be a window. It's hot ice, in fact, <coughs> if you can picture that and understand that. This structure has been solved to be quite an exotic network of hydrogen and oxygen. <coughs> so, <coughs> just to close up this first part and to indicate with this DAC, we can access this region of temperature and pressure space up to millions of atmospheres, okay? corresponding to thousands of kilometers into the Earth's interior and up to these temperatures of thousands of Kelvin. The Earth's core is here at uh, 5,000 Kelvin, about 300,000, uh, 3 million, 3.8 million atmospheres. Um, the, the diamond anvil cells that we have at UJ are indicated over here. This is referred to as a metal basset diamond anvil cell, a piston cylinder diamond anvil cell. The important feature of these is that uh, they are compact, so you can put them into furnaces, under microscopes, into cryostats, put them into your pocket, into your suitcase, travel overseas with them to experiments. Okay? With these cells, and typically these diamond culets that we use, we routinely work in this range over here, okay? You glue a diamond to one plate, a diamond to the bottom plate, and then drive the two plates together by turning screws over here. And uh, I have an example here. In fact, it's nothing like seeing this, the real thing. And all I need to do, if I can see, <laughs> okay, is put a key into the screw Okay, and turn the screws, and that will generate me sufficient force uh, to attain hundreds of thousands of atmospheres. <coughs> uh, that cell, that deck, is at 200,000 atmospheres. Um, here's a view into the cavity of uh, some of our cells. Uh, what we need to do is we need to load in the sample. And then we need, to we need to load in a fluid along with that so that when we squeeze, the pressure is dr exerted from all directions. We refer to that as hydrostatic pressure. And the way we do that is we dunk these miniature cells. Oh, well that's the advantage. We dunk them into a bath of cryogen, open them, and then clamp them close again. Okay? And uh, achieve hydrostaticity. And then we insert two ruby balls into the cavity as well. And that allows us... Uh, sorry? To to measure the pressure. If you look into the cavity here, there's the sample, there's the ruby balls. Under a microscope, we excite uh, with a green laser. It glows back at us. We measure the wavelength at which it's glowing back at us. Okay, and as we increase the pressure, uh, that emission shifts to higher and higher, to higher and higher wavelengths. And that, that's the way we determine the pressure. So, now that you have an idea of how we uh, generate these extreme PT conditions, uh, where uh, are these research activities uh, worldwide? You can see that it's in fact dominated by the Northern Hemisphere. Okay, many labs in Europe, USA, Japan, okay, and not too much activity in the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, there's one dot down on the southern tip here and you can guess where that is. <laughs> <laughs> so we can readily actually establish a niche area. Uh, here's a view of uh, different DACs that different groups use around the world. It's a technically intensive business, okay? And that's why I always harp on the importance of good technical support. So this is a summary of our capabilities that we've established in the last uh, several years or so. Okay, uh, we can bring in visible laser light into the cavity. I've used the facilities of my respondent for that purpose to do Raman spectroscopy, uh, uh, um, investigate mechanical elastic properties. We can bring in X-rays to determine structure. We can bring in far infrared radiation to heat. We can bring in gamma rays uh, from a nuclear origin and measure magnetic electronic properties.
We also have this capability, putting wires into the cavity and measuring electrical transport, and measuring magnetic properties in general by means of uh, this squid magnetization measurements. In addition to, this, to that, we use um, international facilities, okay, the synchrotron. The main advantage being that it provides uh, many stations for doing these measurements. Okay, each station provides an X-ray beam. Okay, and we choose to work at one or two of these stations. Okay, very high intensity, which you cannot attain in the lab. Tightly focused, down to 10 by 10 microns, even smaller these days. You can tune the X-ray energy, and it's polarized beams. If you want to be competitive in this business, you have to use these as probing techniques as well. And we access these techniques, which are not available in the home-based laboratory. And now I'm coming to the uh, uh, last part of my talk. I'm going to give you a few examples of what we've worked on. The first is uh, we've looked at some nanomaterials uh, under high pressure. We're interested to know that uh, if we have a material com comprising these nanophase, nanometric grains on the order of several nanometers, and we squeeze it, how does it respond compared to the bulk material? And we chose this very topical material. Okay, it's a, a well-known semiconductor used in catalysis, energy material, and so on and so on. And my colleague did a simulation and showed that if you squeeze this grain, it starts to become fuzzy, disordered around the surface. And we actually want to check that experimentally. And so uh, off we set to do that. Okay. We brought in uh, laser light call it laser Raman spectroscopy, and Professor Commons' spectrometer. And uh, we look at the scattered light, and at low pressure we get this typical fingerprint of the scattered light, and we see that it's maintained throughout up to 200,000 atmospheres, and then the signal disappears. And we thought, technical problem. Okay? So, we used another technique. We used x-rays this time. And we went to the international facility to do that, we brought x-rays in, they scatter off the sample, and this is the typical fingerprint. And we increase the pressure, and you see again, when you get to 200, above 200,000 atmospheres, the signal disappears, okay? Indicating that the material indeed, as the simulation showed, has become disordered. But to what extent? <coughs> and then if you look at this, uh, you look at the change in volume from this information, you look at the change in volume, <laughs> Uh, of that grain, plotted here as a function of pressure, okay? The bulk, if the grains were big, the deformation would be as follows, okay? But the nanophase deforms much less. In fact, it's 35% stiffer uh, than the bulk. Okay, very, sim very interesting feature of the nanomaterial. And we were then, out of all of that, be able to develop this uh, phase diagram, if I, if, I, if, I, if I may call it that. I've plotted pressure here, as a function of the size of the grains. And when we're dealing with the bulk, macro-sized grains, I haven't shown this to you, it actually starts off in this T phase, converts to a, f a phase two, and then converts to a third structural phase. Okay? And yet I showed you in the nano phase, it remains in this T phase, it's ultra-stable, and eventually it goes amorphous, disordered. And we want to, we're interested in that uh, disordered phase. Okay? And for that purpose, we use a big machine again. And this time we bring x-rays in. We're not interested in how they scatter. We're interested in how they're absorbed. Okay? And thanks to French colleagues, we were able to do these experiments at the Swiss light source. This is the interior, and we access one of these, two or three of these beam lines. Okay? And I'm probing the titanium here specifically, and I have to bring x-rays in of 5 kV, and I have to get those through the diamonds. And the only way I can do that is using such a perforated diamond anvil cell. A small diamond to generate the pressure on top of a platform diamond into, into which we've drilled holes, okay? To have a configuration like this. And the setup uh, looks like this. We use the so-called membrane diamond anvil cell. We can feed gas uh, into the pressure cell Okay, and squeeze the diamonds together. And the important feature of this, we can do it from a remote location. 
The experiment runs here, and we sit outside controlling the pressure. Okay? Um, here I show you a plot of the raw data, absorption, versus X-ray energy. And so what I want to emphasize is we are varying, tuning the X-ray energy. You cannot do this in a home lab. Okay? You need the big machine to tune the energy. You get strong, strong absorp absorption at a, a, a certain energy. We refer to that as an absorption edge. If I magnify that, it looks like this. This pre-edge re region gives me information on the electronic makeup of the titanium. And these wiggles over here give me information on the surrounding structure, it's called the XFs. Okay? And I do a mathematical manipulation of this for my physics colleagues. I take a Fourier transform. Okay? And I have, <coughs> call it intensity on this axis, versus distance from the central titanium atom. And it tells me about the coordination shells around the titanium. Very clearly, the titanium oxygen uh, coordination shell. Very clearly, a titanium next nearest neighbor coordination shell at low pressures. And then these peaks disappear. It means that at high pressure, <coughs> this grain has become fully disordered. More information than what the si simulations give us. It's almost as if you have a liquid phase in solidified form if you can imagine that. We call it a high-density amorphous phase. My, my second example, uh, done by one of my uh, MSc students, we look at this compound, uh, zirconia and, and, and hafnia. These are very important high-temperature materials. In fact, these uh, act as dental implants. And this hafnia has desirable properties that this doesn't have. This has desirable properties that this doesn't have. Uh, what is interesting for us is pressure temperature are these high pressure phases, O1 and O2, because uh, they are strong materials compared to the M phase, which you start off with. And so we ask, we want to have the, both, the, the best of both worlds. So we mix the two together to form a solid solution like this and see if we can get into this phase over here by pressurizing. And in fact, uh, we have to use temperature as well. And so we pressurize the material, but we also have to heat it. Okay, and this is our laser heating station. We use a CO2 for infrared laser to bring the laser light into the cavity and heat. And there's a typical view of a hot spot. And we heat up to on the order of 2000 Kelvin. Okay, for the uninitiated, we use the brightness to, de de to determine the temperature. For my physics colleagues, we use Planck emission to determine the temperature. It's not easy. Um, here you look into the cavity. There's the sample. There are two regions. I call this the island, Robben Island. I call this the peninsula, Cape Peninsula, if you like. That's where it sort of came from, uh, ingest. <coughs> and we can selectively heat regions and leave other regions untouched. And we selected to heat only the peninsula part, OK? And uh, in fact, we brought uh, laser light in. This is laser Raman spectroscopy. See how it's scattered? And this is the typical fingerprint of this high pressure, strong um, O2 phase. <coughs> this is the fingerprint of a mixture of strong O1 and O2 phases, quite complex. And the only way to get from this mixture to a clean phase is after laser heating, namely laser heating the peninsula and not, this was not heated, only pressurized, and it gave us this mess over here. And then the interesting question is, when I take the pressure off, do I keep those desirable phases in? And so we release the pressure back to ambient, and these fingerprints over here still show that the peninsula is O2, a mixture of O2 and O1, and that's okay because it's strong material. But this one that we didn't heat reverts back to the M phase, which is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, structure with properties uh, that are not as good as O2 and O1. And then my third example is uh, being able to probe the magnetic and chemical state, for example, of iron. And this time we bring gamma rays in, which originate from nuclear transitions. And we look at how they are absorbed in the sample. And if we bring gamma rays in of a, sp a particular energy, okay, 
we can probe, we can speciate the iron. If we vary this energy by choosing a different source, we can probe tin, we can probe gold, and so on. Not all the elements, selected elements. And uh, what's important is that we're interested to probe the magnetism of iron-based compounds, and you understand the importance of that, our deep earth contains many iron-based materials, as one example. We can um, vary the temperature to cryogenic temperatures as well. There's a schematic of our setup, uh, the gamma ray source, the diamond anvil cell, the detector, and all of this is loaded into a cryostat. The PhD student has been working on this. And uh, this is a bit technical, but let me try and take you through this. We work on this co compound as an example. And this fingerprint here of the absorption, with all this complicated structure, indicates to us that the iron exists in two chemical states, iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus. And we're able to lower the temperature, and we pick up this complex magnetic signature over here. And the question is, if I now squeeze this material, what happens? Okay? And this is what happens. The spectral profile simplifies. The magnetism changes. We can conclude, and it's a long discussion, that the ion electronic st state has changed yeah. quite substantially. In fact, you've gone from two valence, two chemical states of iron, to a single chemical state of iron, which is somewhere in between, if you can understand that. For my physics colleagues, what's actually happening? Electron hopping from 2 plus to 3 plus and back. A dynamical process. And my last example, we can bring uh, leads, wires into the cavity, and we can measure the resistance of the material. And so you, here you see a material, an uh, iron-based material at uh, 170,000 atmospheres. The sample insulated from the metallic gasket, inject current, measure voltage, and then compute the resistance. And if you look at some data, this is thanks to Philip, okay, you start off in the ambient pressure, low pressure phase, complete change of character to a magnetic phase, we know it's magnetic from other measurements, up to 280,000 atmospheres, and then back off the pressure, and it stays locked into the high pressure phase. Okay, that's staying at a fixed temperature. We can also vary the temperature of all of this, and just to show that off, okay, resistance versus temperature at different pressures. Okay, that's Philip in action. And that brings me uh, to, the cl to a close. Uh, I hope I've uh, demonstrated our uh, pretty unique capabilities and suite of capabilities. I'd like to close uh, with acknowledgments, uh, numerous uh, overseas collaborators, the funding agencies, uh, postdocs, Sao is now at Virginia Tech, uh, Victoria is at Lyon, high pressure lab, the Gaze, a magnetism lab in uh, Grenoble, students, past and present, not all are in high pressure. And as you can see, uh, high pressure physics is almost my religion. <laughs> so you'll allow me to be evangelical in this way. <laughs> That's the end of my presentation. The University of Johannesburg. Rethink. Reinvent.